to the responsibility of being God's minister, being God's servant. Uh, we often use the phrase, and it's true, uh, we're saved to serve. God has a purpose in uh, our life, in His work, in His ministry. We looked in chapter 5 at some of the motives to serve the Lord. Uh, one was in chapter 5, verse 1, just the confidence of heaven. Uh, you know, because we're on our way to heaven, we should be serving the Lord. That's, that's who we are. <laughs> we're heavenly people. We're the kingdom of God. Um, we, we often sing the song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Man, we're collecting a lot of things for, you know, for uh, people who, who don't, not really residents of, of this earth. Uh, we need to be careful that we, we keep our eye on the Lord. Then uh, we saw that another motive was our concern to please Christ. In verse 10 of chapter 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, we're going to give an account, and that should motivate us to serve Him. We're going to be held responsible. But I think the greatest one to, to me is in verse 14, Christ's love for us. The love of Christ constraineth us. You know, that's the greatest motive for serving the Lord. That's the greatest motive for doing, doing anything is because of, of the love of, of Christ. And he says in, in John, we love him because he first loved us. Now, we're, we're like the moon. You know, we're just reflecting his love. And then we looked uh, the last time at uh, the ministry of reconciliation. God has called us, and he talks about us, and uh, the fact that he's given us the ministry and the word of reconciliation. He calls us to be his ambassadors. At the end of, let me read, starting at the verse uh, verse 18, just the very end there, he says, And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, it's chapter 5, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. You know, what a wonderful verse that is. And when you think about the fact that, that God calls us to work with him. Uh, he is, he's given us this ministry of reconciliation. And uh, we have a responsibility. You know, there's many blessings to being a Christian. There's also responsibilities. You know, if you were to work with the top person in your field, uh, maybe the, the guy that wrote the book about what you do, and you got to work with them, boy, you'd say, what an honor. I got to work with Dr. So-and-so. You know, he wrote the book on whatever. Well, we get to work with the Lord. What an honor. What a privilege. Uh, we've received the grace of God. You know, it's put a little bit negative there in verse 1. He says he doesn't want us to receive the grace of God in vain. Well, one of the things that's saying is when you're saved, you've received the grace of God. <laughs> and uh, God wants us to do something with it. Uh, he's, he, we've also received the ministry. You know, we're workers together. Uh, I want to read on. Uh, verse 2, he says, For he saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And then verses 3 through 10, it's one sentence. Boy, you know, I think if you're in English class, you'd get marked for a run-on sentence, but uh, the Lord knows, and we, we believe it's the right sentence. Verse 3, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. That's quite a sentence there, quite a, a verse. And, and one of the things he's pointing out here is that 
while it's an honor to serve the Lord and to serve with the Lord, uh, in verses 8 through 10, he's pointing out the paradox of the ministry. Now, that word paradox means uh, seeming contradiction. Uh, the Christian life is kind of a contradiction. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about being sorrowful, and yet it talks about rejoicing. And as Christians, we're, we're going to have both. And if you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to hit this paradox, this contradiction. Uh, look, for instance, at 2 Corinthians 2, verses 15 and 16. In my Bible, it's just one page back. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 15, he says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. Now, I think what that's saying is that to some people, you're going to stink. You know, when you serve the Lord, they're going to think, ugh, phew, get them out of here. But to others, and especially those who get saved, they're going to say, man, that's the best smell. Mmm, smell that. Savor of life unto life. And it seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? Use the big word paradox, but what Paul is telling us here will help us if we're aware of it ahead of time. You know, if we know that some people are going to react with hate, and others are going to react with love, if we know that ahead of time, that'll help us. Uh, a lot of life is what you expect. If you have expectations and they don't get met, oh, you know, what a, what a blow. If you don't have any expectations, you'll never be disappointed. Now, that's probably not the best way to live. That's not really what he's saying here. But what he's saying is, if you expect sorrow and you expect joy, you won't be surprised by either. Don't just think the Christian life is just going to be all joy and happiness. There's going to be some sorrows. There's going to be some who, who love you. Listen, you lead someone to Christ, they will love you forever. <laughs> and, and I mean literally, forever. <laughs> and what a blessing. But there's others who you'll witness to, and, and man, they'll respond with hatred and anger. Uh, they'll be people who, if they could, they'd put you to death. And we may face those days. But we need to understand, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by either one of these. Paul experienced both. Man, there were people who just, they just loved Paul. You know, they cried when he left. They hung on his neck, the Bible talks about. But there are others who followed him around trying to get him arrested and killed. If we understand this paradox, uh, you know, by honor and dishonor, evil report and good report, uh, it will help us. And Paul points out four things about his own ministry that will help us in this. The first one is, in verse 1 there, Paul knew that serving God was a privilege. I, I think this is a really important point. Serving God is a privilege. We then as workers together with Him. I mean, who could say that? That they get to work with the Lord. We get to say that. You know, when you go out witnessing to people, when you serve in your Sunday school class, when you lead the singing, when you're praying, when, you know, when you're doing the things of the Christian life, you're working with the Lord. That's a privilege. And if you don't believe that, when you face the contradiction of the ministry, you'll quit. If you don't understand that there's both joy and sorrow in the ministry, in the Christian life, if you think it's only going to be joy and, and gladness, if you don't understand that there's people who, who hate the Lord, that God has an enemy who's, who never stops and accuses the brethren and, and does all the, the things he can to bring us down, if you don't understand that contradiction, uh, you'll quit if you don't understand that it's a privilege to serve the Lord. Uh, there, there's no higher uh, privilege than to, to say uh, that He's your Father, that Jesus is your Savior, that you're a child of God, and that you have the ministry. He's given you a ministry of reconciliation. I've been in churches where... I went to a pastor's conference at one church, and I thought, man, I'd be struggling to be the janitor at this church. <laughs> yeah, it's super duper, everything's super duper, you know. But listen, we get to work with the Lord, and we don't have to apologize for that. We don't have to feel bad about that. He wants to work with us, and he has a ministry for us. Serving God is a, is a privilege. I think it comes back to, if you go to chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then as workers together with him. See, Jesus' very ministry was to take our sin upon himself. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with, with grief. That's the ministry we take up. Oh, there's joy in it. No, don't get me wrong. Uh, but there's sorrows too. And uh, that's, that's the ministry that, that Jesus had. In fact, in, in Hebrews, he puts it this way, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see that contradiction there? Joy and shame in the same, same thing. And as Christians, we don't have to focus on, on the negative, but we need to be aware that, that it's there. We need to understand that serving God is a privilege. It, it's interesting, the, the last verse of the book of Mark says, They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. <laughs> and that's the Christian ministry, you know. They went out preaching, the Lord working with them. Now, Paul gives his testimony in 1 Timothy 1, in verse 12, you know, he counted it such a privilege that he was called to the ministry, and he states it here, 1 Timothy 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who is before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly and, and in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. He counted it a privilege to serve the Lord. And you look at his life, man, he, you know, he lays it out. We'll be looking at it another time, you know, all the beatings and all the things that he went through. Uh, and yet he, he knew that just to be able to say, I'm, I'm a servant of the Lord, was a privilege. Serving God is a privilege. And the second thing that he points out, privilege leads to passion. He says there in verse 1, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Paul had a passion for God's work. And he, he pled with them. That, that word beseech means I, I plead with you. Don't let God's grace be wasted in your life. Serve the Lord. It's a privilege. This is important stuff we're doing, is what he's saying. And there's a lot of things that go on. I'm constantly amazed at how people will spend their lives. And I hope I don't insult anybody or anything, but you, you know, you watch the Commonwealth Games, and there's people who have given their lives to handling a hula hoop. <laughs> and, and it's skillful, and I know it takes a lot of, a lot of skill and, and that, but come on, there, there's more important things. You know, they, they would ridicule us for going out on visitation and reading our Bibles and doing the things that really matter. You watch these TV shows and these movies. Man, they invest their lives, their money, everything. Some of them even give their lives just to put a movie that people are going to watch a few times and then it'll be old, be gone. They think that's important. Listen, what we do as Christians is important. Our relationship with the Lord, our presenting the gospel to other people, it's important. We need to have a passion about it. The grace of God means something. He says, don't let it be in vain. And he's talking to you. He's talking to me. This is not just theory we're looking at here. He's saying, don't let it be in vain in your life. You don't have to worry about other people. We need to worry about our relationship with the Lord. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the, the grace of God in vain. We need to have a passion for truth. We need to have a passion to see people saved. We need to have a passion to live for Christ. It, it takes strength. It takes commitment. You know, I'll just be blunt about it. Some people, as Christians, are just useless. And that's what he's saying. There's not a good thing in the world that they ever do. Some, in fact, are a hindrance to the work of Christ. And the Bible talks about that. Listen, that's not the record I want of my life. I don't want to be for the Lord to say, you, boy, you got in the way. I want to be used of the Lord. And I hope you do too. Serving God is a privilege. It should cause us to have a passion for what God wants to do. 
You know, we see God's grace and salvation. I think it's indicative that the second verse, he talks about salvation. He says, He saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And, and I think one of the things he's pointing out there is, is that you got saved. Yeah, you know, when you needed to get saved, God was there and, and he, he did what was necessary. He succored you and he, he helped, that means he helped you in the day of salvation. And he's saying, now is the time to do the same for others. Others need to be saved and now is the time. We don't know if they have tomorrow. Uh, we need to have a passion for the, for the work of God. But, you know, as Christians, we're living in a world that is, is presenting all kinds of things as truth that aren't truth. And we need to stand for the truth. It needs to be important to us. One of the, the areas that, that comes up is the way of salvation. There's a lot of groups that teach a, a wrong way of salvation. We need to have a passion for the grace of God. Listen, it's not by works of righteousness which we've done. Many, most churches, that's what they teach. Salvation by works. Others by a mystical experience. Uh, we need to have a passion for what's true. God's salvation is really pretty plain and, and clear in the Bible. It, it's not that hard to find it. Uh, Christ is the truth. We need to have a passion to live for Christ. Uh, we, we've talked recently about sanctification. Uh, you know, as Christians, we need to allow the Lord to be uh, working holiness in our, our life. We need to be careful uh, that we're, we're following the Lord. Uh, God writes in Galatians 3, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? You know, we're saved by the Spirit of God. We're not saved by, by our flesh, by our works of righteousness. Uh, religion is basically fleshly. You know, stuff people make up to impress people. Uh, the only religion in, in the Bible is helping the fatherless and the widows and their affliction and, and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. That's the only time religion's ever mentioned in the Bible. Most religion is, is of the flesh. God says, are you so foolish? You're saved by the Spirit, now you're going to continue in the flesh? Uh, we need to have a passion for the truth and for the, the way of the Lord. We need to be passionate about living for the Lord by His standard. And you know, Paul was determined to do that because the third thing I would show you here in verse 3 is he was determined to protect the ministry that God had given him. You see it there in verse 3? Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. You know, as Christians, we've seen in chapter 5, that God's given us the ministry of reconciliation. We represent the Lord. That's why, that's why the world calls us Christians, little Christs, you know, followers of Christ. And as we serve the Lord, sure, it's going to be difficult. There's going to be that, that contradiction of, you know, people who hate us and people who love us. But it's a privilege to serve Him. And we need to be careful that we're not getting in the way of the, ministry, of the ministry that God has, uh, wants to accomplish. Uh, put it this way, our personal behavior should not be an excuse for someone to reject Christ. Right. Now, there'll be times when you're misunderstood. Uh, there'll be times when you do exactly the right thing and, and they'll, they'll accuse you for it and, and so on. But listen, we shouldn't be hateful. Uh, you, you know, we shouldn't be angry people, dishonest people, and, and so on. Uh, we should be people of the Lord. Paul talked in Romans chapter 2 uh, to legalists, I, I think is who he's talking to. Romans 2 verse 23, when he says, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Uh, you know, there's, there's those who, man, they're, they're so strong on the legal things of the Bible, till it comes to them, they can bend the rules. Uh, we need to have a, a, an appreciation and, and a passion for, for God's Word, and we need to protect His, uh, his testimony. Uh, we should be protective of the glory and integrity of the truth, careful of God's testimony and what we do and what we don't do. You notice in verse 3 and 4 there, there were some things that Paul wouldn't do. He doesn't list them, but he says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the minister's of God. Yeah, that means there's going to be some things you're not going to do because it would, it would show badly on the Lord. They would say, you're, Christians do that? You treat me like that and, and you say you, you love the Lord? 
Uh, you know, there's just some things that, and you can get into it more in, in the book of Romans. Sometimes there's things that there's nothing wrong with them, but it would push someone away from, from the gospel. Uh, it, would, it would discourage them. It would, it would hurt them. It would wound them. And sometimes we just have to set aside our, our liberty. We say, well, I could do that, but I'm not going to do it because I love this person more than I love that, that thing. Listen, if you have a choice in life, always put people over things. Protect the ministry. Consider Christ's testimony. Consider your church's testimony. You know, there, there's, there's people who know you attend this church. And, and if you're a, a rat bag, they're going to say, well, that's a church of rat bags. <laughs> you know, we, we need to be careful in, uh, in our lives. Then there were some things that he did. Verse 4, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. Uh, some of these were things that he just endured. Uh, these weren't things that he went out of his way to find. Uh, in fact, earlier on, it's interesting, in, in 2 Thessalonians 4.17, he calls it, for our light affliction. Tell you what, it doesn't sound like light affliction to me when you read about the life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, but he, he knew that compared to eternity, really, the things we'll endure, they're, they're really they're just light affliction. Uh, you know, our life will look back and it'll be like a vapor uh, that's come and gone. Uh, there's some things that we're going to endure as Christians just because we love the Lord, just because He's given us uh, this ministry of, of reconciliation, because we don't want to be a hindrance to the ministry. But then in verses 6 and 7, there's some things that He practiced and believed. You know, as, as Christians, it's so important what we believe. We need to believe and practice what God teaches uh, and he kind of divides them up into, into groups here in verse 6, uh, by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering. You know, as Christians, we need to, to live pure lives. Uh, we need to have knowledge. You know, when you get saved, you don't quit thinking. Have you ever done something and you thought, oh, boy, I didn't think about that? Usually you're saying it to your wife, you know. Oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> uh, we need to think. We need to think ahead. We need to let God uh, use our minds and, and the, we need to know what He said. Uh, he talks about long-suffering. Then He says, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. We need to practice those things. A and not just kindness to people who are kind to us. You know, when, when people are unkind to us because we're Christians, the Bible uses the expression, we need to heap coals of fire on their head. <laughs> that means do something good for them when they do something bad for you. Uh, by the Holy Ghost, you know, God's Spirit speaking to us through His Word by love. And He doesn't just say love, love unfeigned. <laughs> it's easy sometimes to do the right thing and not really mean it, isn't it? He says, don't be a phony. Love unfeigned. Then He says, by the Word of truth. You know, the Word of truth is how we got saved. You realize that? Ephesians chapter 1 and, and verse 13. He says, in whom also ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. It's important that we know the word of truth. In 2 Timothy, he says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? The word of truth. We need to know it. We need to use it. And he talks about the power of God. You know, when we serve the Lord, we're not just doing it alone. God's promised to never leave us or forsake us. He's promised to help us and go with us. I often make the mistake of thinking, oh, I don't know what to do, or I'm not capable here or there. And we forget, the Lord's, the Lord's with us. The power of the Lord is, is with us. Uh, Romans he, uh, chapter 1, he, he talks about, um, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Man, uh, we need to, to believe and practice these things. In uh, that verse as well, he, he, uh, some of the commentators call this uh, two-fisted Christianity. Uh, let me get back to where I, where I started here. Chapter 6, uh, verse 7, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Yeah, we've, we've got what God gives us, uh, both hands. We can go after it. We don't have to, uh, to worry. We need to believe and, and practice these things. And the reason we do them is we want to be approved as the ministers of God. 
We want to believe and practice what God would teach us. Let me ask you, have you considered these and things like this? Have you considered it in your life? You know, God has called you to serve him. And the importance of, of believing and practicing what God teaches. In verse 4, I think there's a statement that really sums up Paul's ministry. When he says, in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience. Uh, Paul just endured. He just kept, kept going. They'd throw him in jail. They'd beat him. One time they thought they'd killed him. Maybe they did. But they hold him out, hold his dead body out. He, they were standing around watching. He stood up and said, okay, where are we going next? <laughs> he had an amazing fellow. And yet the power that he experienced is the same today as we serve the Lord in much patience. Now let me tell you, patience comes at a cost. Tribulation worketh patience. But as I began to look at it, I real, realized patience also comes with accessories. <laughs> and there are some things that God adds as, as we learn patience. In James 1.3, he says, The trying of your faith worketh patience. It comes with faith. 1 Thessalonians 1.3, Remembering your patience of hope. Patience comes with hope. Colossians 1, he says, Strengthen unto all patience with joyfulness. Patience comes with joy. Those are some pretty good accessories that go with patience, endurance. Serving the Lord involves endurance. You're not, not quitting just means keep, keep going. You know, sometimes you'll quit one thing to do another. It doesn't mean you're, you're always going to do exactly the same thing every day of your life, but we need to keep serving the Lord. We need to endure. You know, endurance is not just waiting for trouble to stop. I think sometimes that's the picture we get. You know, our head down and just... I, w I went and visited June one time in the hospital. And she was just holding... Sorry. Holding on to the bed. And a lot of times that's how we think of endurance. She just The pain was so, so strong. All she could do was just hold on to the bed and just endure. But the kind of endurance we're talking about here is not like that. It's not just holding on. It's, it's serving the Lord with faith and serving Him with hope and serving Him with, with joyfulness. Uh, it involves service, the ministry that God has, has given to us. Yes, the Christian life is a paradox. Uh, you'll have sorrow. You, you read these things, and they're just so uh, accurate as to how it, how it goes. Honor and dishonor. Evil report and good report. Deceivers and yet true. You know, the same person, you have all these contradictory uh, things going on in their life. Listen, Christ lived it. Paul lived it. So can you. So can I. We can have the joy of the Lord in spite of the sorrow. We can have the strength of the Lord in spite of our weakness. God can use us to be the ministers that He wants us to be. There's a responsibility in being God's minister. Uh, we work with Him. It's a privilege. Uh, it, we should have a passion about that because uh, of, of our work with the Lord. We should protect that ministry, not let it be damaged by our testimony or the things that we do or don't do. And, and we need to just endure the paradox that God has put us in right now. Uh, someday, things are going to be different. <laughs> someday, we'll not only be with the Lord, we'll be like the Lord. And what a blessing. Uh, we go through things now. But God has said He'll go with us and He'll never leave us. You know, we, we serve Him. We can go through this contradictory difficulty because we know the Lord and serving Him is a privilege. Let's, uh, let's just have a word of prayer and then we're, we're going to sing a song. We're going to sing the song, It's Wonderful to Be a Christian. I thought that'd be a good way to end tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Uh, Father, we don't understand all the things that we face, but uh, Lord, we, we believe what you've said. We believe that you've called us and you, you go with us and Lord that you can use us. Oh, we believe that people need to be saved. We believe that there is a heaven and that there is a hell. Lord, help us to, uh, uh, to not be surprised when, when people respond in a bad way. And Lord, help us not to be surprised when people get saved. Help us just to, to serve you and to trust you. Thank you for your goodness and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.